Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 646. This is 646 of the Agostino Zynga show and I hope you are doing well wherever this podcast may find you. I hope you are doing splendid. How am I? All good, all things considered putting one foot in front of the other and taking one step at a time trying to get closer and closer to my goals as I try I'm looking forward to going out on the weekend can you tell can you tell can you tell it's been a while it's been a while gonna be tearing up the scene gonna be in Coco Camden to see Dixon play all night that should be splendid there may be another occasion to go out on Saturday that should be splendid there may be something else to do on Sunday that should be splendid or I may just stay in and watch the UFC and stream that all day. It just depends. It just depends. But talking about stuff I've been doing and getting up to, I have finished or the finale of Happy Valley just happened the other day. I only binged it recently, a week or so ago. It's been featured on my BBC I Play homepage forever. I think most people was the same thing. And um, I never really paid much attention to it. When I initially saw the post of Happy Valley, I just assumed it would be some, you know, drama, soppy, emotional, um, cringy, rommy, commy, comedy type show, right? I'm not really a fan of those type of things. So I left it alone. But when I did give it a try, oh my, oh my, was I surprised and was I delighted. It was legitimately a really decent cop tv drama and to be fair anyway when it comes to the uk we do really good cop tv dramas like even ones that aren't that serious ones that are a little bit more slapstick they're a little bit more drama based like things like the bill but i think of other stuff you know thriller type stuff like you know spooks being really good so we do do a good job of kind of handling those shoes i think even another one i think it's called hardwood or something so they're pretty decent it's pretty hard to find a tv series and from the uk that involves police officers and investigating crime or organized crime crime or mi5 or espionage all that sort of stuff that isn't good it's very hard to find it i thought it started off amazing if anything i thought whoever wrote i forgot the, the person who wrote the series so please don't hold me to it the names and stuff because i don't remember all this sort of stuff i'm just going to give you my overview of happy valley i thought what they did really well was situating the village and also giving you a kind of idea of what village life, village life is actually like in some way shape or form i would imagine because for all the quaint you know getting out getting away from the city type of vibes that i have with the village because obviously i'm from a metropolitan city here in london people that actually live there know the truth of it and it's not as rosy as it seems on the surface so when you kind of you know you know dig a bit and scrape away from all that you get to see what's really going on you know the backstabbing um the rumors the gossiping um some really kind of quote-unquote evil things going on behind the scenes you start to realize that most villages and most little small towns have this sort of thing going on you know in some way shape or form or in some aspects and i love how they were able to really tell those stories all at once right so tell, tell stories about local politics organized crime mass immigration drugs epidemic antisocial behavior um you know family issue stuff like they, they told it really well especially the first two seasons but if anything i would say the third season kind of fell off a cliff a little bit and more so because of just how unrealistic ryan is as a teenager and his relationship quote unquote with his flipping dad um tommy and again this is major spoiler alert so if you haven't watched it please skip ahead and if you don't want to hear anything about happy valley but i thought the relationship tommy had with his i thought the relationship ryan had sorry with tommy didn't make any sense in the series because in the series um tommy is responsible or he's blamed for the death of um Catherine what's her name in here Catherine Carewood's daughter so essentially for what we can understand in the show um Tommy Lee um what pushed um Catherine's daughter to the brink you know maybe gaslighting mind game manipulation just being an absolute piece of shit and then ended up kind of you know impregnating um the daughter and I think there's an assumption that it was by rape and obviously when the daughter was sorry when the when the daughter did give birth she then suffered maybe from postpartum or something and basically she was pushed to the edge until the point where she self-expired so the family kind of blames a lot of the 
damage that happened post the Catherine Cable's daughter dying on this Tommy guy. And I think as when the daughter died, Catherine Cable and her and her husband split up because Catherine went to look after the flipping baby. Um, because no one went to look after the baby. One of the brothers moved out of the home. It really fractured the entire family, as you'd imagine self expiry would do, right? Especially for a, a close knit family in a small village. It kind of rocked them to their core and they're still suffering from the after effects of it. So Tommy's got a lot of blame, you know, on his hands and he's caused a lot of damage and he's hurt a lot of people within that direct family alone but of course he also happens to be ryan's dad right the kid that came out of that whole horrible ordeal um you know his name's ryan and that's obviously his dad but i think in the beginning when he's a kid and he finds that out i think it's somewhat interesting and makes sense because he's acting out in school he's kind of maturing into a young quote-unquote young man or whatever right he's starting to realize his power he's maybe showing tendencies of you know crazy unpredictable um impulsive kind of traits that maybe tommy has so it's maybe some cause for alarm i understand that especially if you're a parent that makes complete sense but then it feels like when it's season three and he becomes a teenager why does ryan still persist on trying to have a relationship with this person with tommy it makes no sense and it really throws off the entire show it's not believable in the slightest it doesn't make any sense why any 16 year old who's aware and can read between the lines that this person who you called dad was also responsible for putting your grandmother who's also essentially your you know surrogate mother at this point or your de facto mother in hospital for four months responsible for killing one of her colleagues by reversing a car over the dead body a couple of times like absolutely heedless stuff like legit murderer you know he killed two of his friends in a flat loads of people got a trail of bodies actually tommy in the series he actually murdered a lot of people so the fact that ryan still tries to pursue a relationship with his dad throughout season three just doesn't make any sense to me the other bit that's really annoying that kind of threw me off and didn't really make for a good finale was how claire suddenly became an op like suddenly the sister of Catherine Carewood who kind of knows everything that happened at the time was there, was maybe helping to, you know, mend whatever wounds that Catherine Carewood might have had from that experience, was also one of the first people, one of the first people to go and accompany Ryan um, to visit his dad in prison. Right? It just didn't make any sense for me. It just didn't make any sense. If anything, the escape from the, um, you know, from the court made a lot of sense because I think there's a couple of articles I saw and got on a Reddit that basically you know showed a lot of kind of elaborate um escapes from magistrate offices or courts in general when people are getting tried here in england it probably happens quite often and imagine in england too without the threats of guns um it probably is a risk worth taking especially if you're going to get double digit or live prison sentences just be out a few more weeks on a run i completely understand it so i can believe that could happen right where a gang could organize the escape of somebody that's you know done some heinous crimes you know in open court i can understand that happening for sure but for me the claire thing just didn't make any sense why would the sister be willing to go with the son to go it just didn't make any sense if anything they should have wiped their hands of ryan and let him go by himself and arrange it i mean whatever happens happens after that regard but clearly they didn't want to do that because you know nice people but i felt personally that the finale wasn't that great i know some people like the guardian are really harping on about how amazing it was but i think they're essentially just you know they're kind of capping and lying to be honest this is a review here from the guy says happy valley finale review one of the tv's greatest trilogies gets a fiery farewell i don't know if it's the greatest trilogy i think the first two seasons were solid i think the third kind of fell off a cliff um, it says here yeah, brutal tender funny compelling and heartbreaking to the last um there is nothing left to do now but look back on happy valley and bid all its dizziness and um, their creator and or an ode so bid to bid its denzies it's din denizens whatever that word is i never heard of that word denizens and their creator and an or an awed farewell after three seasons sally wainwright has concluded one of the greatest trilogies in modern television she always planned to tell her bereaved protagonist story in a uh, three parts you feel even though she hadn't felt like keeping her word Catherine care would herself would step in and make sure she did Catherine um sarah lancashire of course is the center of happy Valley's dramatic universe and the partnership between lancashire and wainwright is drama's equivalent of victoria wood and julia waters separately they are brilliant together they're in invincible in a professional capacity sergeant Kerwood knows every bad and, and generally twats and sometimes shit post shit pot sorry good and, and doing their best and in the in the colder valley outside work 
She assisted to recovering alcoholic Claire and a former wife of Richard um, Derek Riddle and a mother of two and a grandmother of one. She's also the woman who is, will go to her grave mourning the loss of a 16 year old, of the loss of 16 years ago of her 18 year old daughter Becky, who died by suicide after being raped and impregnated by the ship host, by the ship pot of ship pots, Tommy Lee Royce, which is played by James Norton. Again, he played that role really well, so big up him. We have spent three seasons seeing Catherine wrestle with grief, um, watching her try not to be consumed by the hatred of Tommy and find her way through the fear, love, and worry, resentment that were incapable of part of raising Ryan, the baby Becky left behind. The other thing that was also weird, I thought, was this random storyline with the Faisal, the Asian dude that works in the chemist or owns a few chemists and him being responsible for basically the benzo epidemic that happens in that small town suddenly murdering a woman kind of getting away with it it didn't make any sense again because he's quite clumsy he has to go you know because i think he's neighbors with a lady in the tv series and to go into her home i guess it's also assumed that they're having an affair where he's getting some sort of sexual favors for giving her benzos and whatnot but to get to the house he kind of jumps over the garden wall and stuff but he's not very athletic he's kind of a frail looking guy kind of clumsy kind of you know whatever and somehow no one sees him all these times this kind of asian dude is climbing over fences you know in daytime in a small village where people are always window twitching and you know looking at their neighbors and seeing wild guan and being nosy no one spotted him like for real come on let's be real and then he became the kind of the perfect murderer and able to get away with it with little to no repercussions i don't really think that made sense so there's parts of it that really threw me off that i didn't really like um but it continues here let's end the review Oh, it's more of it. It's so long. Um, the plot of the episode left the general sense of there being an awful lot, possibly too much to do in the finale. Even with the extended running time of 17 minutes, Tommy had escaped from prison and made contact with Ryan, encouraging him to run away with him to Spain. Catherine and Claire's relationship had been sundered, seeming irreparably by the deepest betrayal. But that's the thing, like I said, like I just didn't find funny. I didn't make any sense. Like In the end, the kid's talking to the guy through a PlayStation. He's um and ari whether or not he should go to flipping Marbella with him. It's just bullshit it didn't make any sense especially when you consider the damage that tommy has done to his direct family and to somebody that he said he loves and somebody that's essentially his de facto mother in Catherine Kaywood. i just didn't understand the premise behind that all oh, it continues um don't doubt wayne wright said was a lesson of the finale um as sure-footed as many well walkers and aided by the cast without a weak link she took us through the neat but truthful resolutions to every part of the story it had a redemption justice bitter laughs and fire in its blood now it's all over farewell then to our magnificent valley girl let's hope Catherine finally gets her peace where she's going but yeah all right decent show enough to watch um not up there with stuff like spooks of course not even stuff like the bill is probably a lot bit lot better than this but i think as a short you know um mini series type of thing especially if it's going to end after three seasons and that's it we just walk away like you know how the wire did four perfect seasons fair enough fair enough but i think it started off really good season one season two and then season three for me got a little bit you know it didn't really it wasn't really grounded in any sort of uh, believability it kind of pulled me out of it and i kind of got a little bit annoyed and again the the, the face off between you know C Catherine carewood and flipping tom at the end come on brother like this this guy was legitimately at the point of him escaping from prison he's under the assumption or well for some reason that he thinks Catherine carewood was responsible for his mother's death whether indirectly or directly and he's he's filled with rage that's why he's consuming rage that's why he decides or that's why he says when he's actually escaping from prison he asks the guy that he's in the flipping van with have you got a gun or something because his mission which might end up you know messing up his escape plan to live this that's the thing that makes sense for the series at the end of it sorry let me just before we move on the Tommy Lee character is basically it feels like coming to a quiet acceptance that this ideal getaway of like escaping court on a bicycle you know right under the nose of the police and then being whisked away in a van to a nondescript place somewhere to wait for your son to decide if he wants to come to my bear with you to live your life happy and whatnot um is like a pipe dream he comes to accept it because he's so consumed by revenge because you kind of feel like this whole series is about revenge it's about you know um, suppressed trauma and not addressing the pain of yesteryears whatever right but revenge is kind of a through line that kind of ties it all together and he's willing to risk his um life 
to basically amend or to kind of correct whatever ills went on, especially if he thinks that Catherine Kerwood was the one responsible for killing his mum. So he goes back to that town to wait for his son, but also slash to kill Catherine Kerwood. Then he gets there and because he's injured in a fight before he gets there, he just sits there and starts talking and then douses himself in petrol and lights himself on fire. Like, come on, really? The same guy that was like legitimately happy to like run over somebody he just met and doesn't know much about because she happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time is now suddenly the person that's going to be, you know, lighting themselves on fire after sobbing and crying that they want to be a good dad. I just didn't think that was believable. It didn't make much sense to me and I didn't really like it. So for me, not so great. I wouldn't give it five stars, maybe three as a final season. But hey, we've all got different criteria when it comes to that sort of stuff, innit? Next week, we want to mention and talk about the controversy regarding the Grammy Awards and the album of the year specifically, because some people, majority, it has to be, we have to kind of, you know, let it be known. It's mostly Beyonce fans. So the Beehive on social media is really kicking up a fuss and letting it known that they are not happy that Beyonce did not win album of the year at the Grammys 2023 but to be fair to be fair having looked at the list of you know nominees for album of the year you got ABBA you got Adele Bad Bunny Beyonce Brandy Carly Coldplay Harry Styles Kendrick Lamar Lizzo and Mary J Blige there's not really a lot of great music to choose from a lot of these albums I hadn't listened to ABBA for instance The Voyage was completely forgettable I don't even know how that made it into a list maybe that's just like um it's just like a nomination that you make for just being a legend or maybe for having a lot of kind of good faith and whatnot and a lot of kind of good memories tied to some of your older hits. But that ABBA album was really, really bad. Adele 30, for me, all Adele songs sound the same. And if I was really going to go for choose one person who I thought maybe deserved album of the year when you think about cultural impact, when you think about um, artistry, when you think about replay value, so replay value is a good, good measurement, especially if you're going to categorize or trying to, you know, award people for album of the year like in a calendar year i think reaper Valley is a good one and i think one album that i kind of go back to again and again is bad bad bunny on verano senti i think for me that should have been album of the year but of course you know with it being a latin trap album whatever reggaeton it's never going to win it especially the fact that you know it's not even you know he's not even singing in english for goodness sake he never does so that's never going to happen anytime soon but maybe that deserved even more so over Beyonce Renaissance. Because as much as I enjoyed Renaissance, as much as I thought it did kind of spur a really interesting kind of house type revival within the quote unquote black hip hop, urban R&B kind of, you know, uh, environment I still think overall it was quite forgettable and if anything a good sign of how forgettable Beyonce Renaissance was was how weak I thought the remixes were. There was a couple of remixes here and there. I think Keishinada may have had one or maybe played one, sorry, he shared a clip of himself playing one, but I didn't see a lot of really standout um, remixes. If anything, the actual album cuts are better than the remixes so far. There's not been many remixes that have really kind of, you know, turned the tide and made people think, oh no, this album's flipping amazing. So there's a little bit of disappointment. So the only thing I would say with Harry Styles is that similar to flipping, you know, Taylor Swift, the issue that he has is that he does make some bops. There are some good tunes here and there from the stuff that he puts together. But unfortunately, with the nature of the music that he makes and who he appeals to, with it being normies, you can't really push the envelope too far and you have to kind of stay in some some sort of pocket even if it is a pocket of your own design it's still a pocket that people can know you for so for the most part that usually i would imagine equates to being very safe and that's what you feel with you know harry styles music it feels very very safe and for me you know looking at an album of the year I wouldn't say they all need to be kind of avant-garde pushing the envelope type of stuff, but you need to have a little bit of replay value. It can't be too safe in the pocket either. You need to be able to push the envelope slightly. So that's your only criticism I have with it. But, you know, it's not really enough to kind of kick up a fuss and make a campaign and say the Grammys is cancelled because Beyonce didn't win. Um, it just kind of is what it is, nature of the beast. And also, who knows what even the criteria is judging what the album of the year is at the Grammys. What is the criteria? Is it the quality of music? Um, and who is judging this quality? Because, you know, you imagine a lot of them probably don't have the greatest taste if they were able to pick flipping Mac Lamar over Kendrick Lamar that year. So clearly there's an issue there, but I didn't really think it's that big of a problem to people to kind of kick up a fuss about Harry Styles winning it, in my humble opinion. 
Then we move on to some of the best and worst moments of the 2023 Grammy. This is courtesy of New York Times Magazine, which I thought was very really interesting to kind of pull from. Number one, of course, they mentioned the best opening salvo, Bad Bunny. I legitimately did think that was one of the best kind of openings they would have done for the Grammy, especially when you consider how joyful and boppy but Bad Bunny's um, music is for the most part he performed amazing as we know him too if you've seen clips of him on tour doing arenas and whatnot and playing in clubs and just being an absolute lad you would see that his live shows have kind of gone from strength to strength to strength I think even there was a moment actually last year maybe I think when Kanye was going on all these rants and going all over the place and talking to anyone that put a camera in his face I remember him mentioning something along the lines of like him and his friends or people he's in the studios with when they're putting music together they always have somebody they're kind of aiming to sort of surpass and one person they wanted to kind of you know have on a list of someone they're looking to kind of emulate and do better than was flipping uh, what's his name bad bunny because of how much effort and money he puts into his shows how good of a live performer he is um i think he just works amazingly so that was pretty cool to see him do his bits and bobs and also small little bits about iconography or just you know messaging the fact that he was performing up there wearing a pair of like light blue jeans a white t-shirt and a flipping backwards cap right pure americana but you know done through the lens of somebody from puerto rico right through like a latino guy right i do like that kind of vibe i thought that was really good like kind of tying in his kind of origin story and his actual culture by having people from you know i thought well i don't know what they were dancing but flamenco type dancers that were on the stage also i thought that was a quite a nice little tie-in that was going on there on the show overall so i really did enjoy that the other one they said here best acceptance was kim petra's moving speech about trans trans existence um kim petras and what's it what's his name sam smith won an award for the song called unholy i guess that's the one everyone's getting you know pissed off about but what i discovered from this acceptance was that kim petras was trans and i had no idea so that was very enlightening to find out in real time but overall i didn't really think much of the tune didn't really think much of the performance i didn't necessarily care um the hip-hop tribute here um which is the top 50 hip-hop tribute i didn't like in the slightest i thought it was horrible it looked like they didn't practice there was no choreography no one was on beat people looked like they were screaming and shouting the best thing about that was maybe you know Louis Vert coming out and doing his I just want to rap flipping dance right his little skank that was pretty cool but overall it was largely forgettable very boring no very cringe sorry, not boring very cringe and embarrassing and I don't ever want to see that ever again um, worst free part worst free Pete sorry was Trevor Noah um, I thought all these comedy host guys did pretty bad Gerald Carmichael did pretty horrible at the Golden Globes I thought wasn't funny at all in the slightest he was going through some existential crisis in terms of figuring out if he should have done the awards in the first place and he kind of you know put that nervous energy and up tightness into the show and how he presented it and hosted it and it kind of didn't really help or work and Trevor Noah just in general I just think isn't that funny and isn't that great of a host so it just was never going to work so I wasn't that interested about that uh, Beyonce being smile smiling and coming late everyone was getting annoyed about that and how Trevor Noah did, you know introduced her who cares another one which I thought was hilarious was this bit, which is um, featured on New York Times Magazine, feature of it. It says, worst participation trophy was a useless fan segment. <laughs> Where they essentially, it felt it felt like, anyway, maybe it's not true, but it felt like the Grammys hired paid actors or people who, you know, said they were super fans, but weren't actually super fans, got around the table and started talking about how much they loved so-and-so a person for album of the year. And I thought it was horrible because if anything the grammys is quite stuffy and quite rigid in what they do and clearly i think the grammys isn't necessarily made for like a gen z um millennial type audience anyway it's meant, i would assume it's mostly made for boomers and for whatever reason they were probably stuck between a rock and a hard place where they're waiting to tap into a little bit, especially fan culture, especially when it comes to Twitter and whatnot and the discourse around the Grammys, they're waiting to tap into it in some way. So they got these people around the panel discussions to talk about, um, you know, the Grammys and the nomination of people that they liked and whatnot. And it just didn't work because it just came across false and fake and not something that was real. Um, the next one here says, best tribute that should have never been necessary was Quaver remembering takeoff. This, of course, was beautiful. It really did bring a tear to most people's eyes seeing Quavo on stage performing such a touching and real tribute to take off I really did enjoy it. I think most of us have seen the video of him performing the same song looking very gaunt looking very sad looking very sullen as he kind of you know just hears the song maybe play for the first time actually and finally cut 
but I thought that song was really done really well. The only issue with this was the whole kerfuffle around this. Um, you know, it kind of led to Offset having a back and forth with Jay Prince. Then stories are coming out now of Quaver and allegedly um, Offset getting into altercation behind the stage or backstage because um, Offset wanted to come on stage and perform or be there when Quaver was doing his tribute to take off and Quaver didn't want that or something along those kind of lines and it got into some sort of tussle. I don't seriously have an issue with it personally. I, you know, maybe if it's because it's family and regarding what's happening, I do understand maybe, you know, especially trying to bury the hatchet publicly, it would have been nice for them to kind of go on stage and do that. But if they haven't done the work off stage to really heal whatever rift they have going on, for whatever reason it is, getting on stage and pretending and faking the fuck in the name of honoring someone's legacy doesn't necessarily sit right with me either. So I can understand both sides of the of the story in that regards. But obviously the sad thing for Offset is it now it's opened a whole another can of worms regarding, you know, the Prince family and J you know J Prince and J Prince Jr. and all these kind of people coming out and essentially, you know, attacking Offset, basically saying he wasn't really down with the family. No one likes him. He's trying to clout chase off the back of this. Like it's pretty troubling. So that was a new about horrible thing to see off the back of that touching, touching tribute. I thought Beyonce's appreciation of, of sorry. Lizzo's appreciation of Beyonce was very well done also, even though it's a tad cringe, she did pretty well. And of course, the other ones we don't necessarily care about. But overall, um, Grammys were decent for what they were. I still think they don't do good enough in terms of trying to tap into the conversation around it on social media. They tend to do it very, they tend to be kind of, you know, a little bit laissez-faire with it, not necessarily caring too much. But I do think if they were able to tap into that better, maybe make it a little bit more of a loose show, not so stuffy and remove some of the actionness, it could definitely, definitely impact culture on a far bigger scale. But I'm sure, you know, from the sponsorships they get in anyway, just sitting here, they probably don't necessarily need to hear need to hear my advice when it comes to those things. I don't think they need to hear it. Then I want to quickly touch upon Little Yatty's new album called Let's Start Here, which I've been absolutely banging and enjoying for the past week or so since it dropped. I really, really, really do enjoy this album. I think most of you who know me would know that I'm a big Tame Impala fan. Um, since the first album, to be honest, I've been flipping in love with that band forever. I think, if anything, they probably just reminded me of why I loved MGMT for so long. And because MGMT went on a bit of a hiatus, they kind of had big gaps in their you know, drops. Um, Tame Impala came in and kind of feel that kind of psych prog rock shoegazy type of vibe for me they filled that niche really well and it reminded me a lot of the kind of indie dance stuff that I was into as well back in the day to DJ with so I've always kind of had an affinity with Flippin' Taming Parlor and sometime last year I'm gonna say if I'm gonna double check my flipping um Apple Music thing Taming Parlor did put out a remix EP for uh, let me just double check it here that I remember seeing a remix EP for Slow Rush. Yeah, that's the one. Slow Rush, right? It's a B-side remix EP. And it's really well done. For, 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 for starters, the cover's brilliant. You know, Tame Impala always have flipping deep, deep covers. But it's called Slow Rush B-sides and Remixes, and it came out last year. And there was a track on here called Breathe Deeper, which is a track that you know, Tame Impala already have on their album. But it was a remix featuring Lil Yachty, and I thought it was incredible incredibly well done little yeah he comes in straight away first verse and kind of holds the entire tune right into the middle until it kind of switches out into the regular um you know um kind of tune and chorus and whatnot and i thought the bop and the beat and how he kind of flowed on the track was awesome and again you have to imagine this is me being exposed to little yeah recently when he's going through his memphis thing and he's kind of jumping onto that wave and putting out great collaborative albums and jumping on people's songs and really trying those interesting things when it comes to rap he was trying to just just having fun doing a good thing and then he's doing this and then of course that was amazing and the next musical thing i see him legitimately putting out was um poland right um and that was a random little throwaway thing that leaked that kind of became its own little thing and then you're just assuming okay he's just going to put out an album you know cuts full of that kind of similar type of sound and instead he just reverts and goes the complete others the other way and decides to put out essentially a psych rock album and i legitimately have to commend the guy even if you're not a fan of it i think the bravery it requires to be somebody in his pocket who can clearly churn out a lot of those flipping great bangers and hits that he has in his arsenal and just make that work he decided to go the opposite way or go the complete opposite way and do something completely different and basically 
you know draw a line on the sand and kind of progress as an artist from there because i would hope so my hope would for little yati would be that he doesn't even try to continue trying to perfect this sound he just changes it again next album i think that'll be pretty sick to see um so he does basically just takes the kind of kanye west approach to it or maybe maybe there is some sort of maybe a refinement that could be done going on like an iteration like similar to what tired creator kind of does but i feel like if you're trying to create like sonically and theme wise and tone and sound it just feels different each album there's no way you kind of tie there are maybe some chords or some strings or some you know the run there's a running through line throughout most of these albums i'm sure you can kind of point out but for the most part you would still say when you hear of a tyler the creator album coming you know and he's working on something it's usually something going to be interesting somebody fresh something i've ever seen before so i love the fact that luya is kind of going in that, that direction as well so hopefully this becomes a thing that he sort of continues on and doesn't see the lack of sales or the lack of coverage as a bad thing because i think again similar to what happened with playboy kai and whole lot of red where a lot of people like myself included didn't really get the album until we saw it live i feel like this album may be the same i think a lot of people who don't like the album once they see him performing it live you know in a festival or something or his live show somewhere suddenly it'll start to click oh okay this is why he did this this way and why this flipping rocks but i think this is going to work really well personally for me um i think to pick out a couple of tracks that i actually liked that i thought was sick number one i'll definitely say running out of time I thought that was absolutely amazing. Personally, for me, I think it's one of my um, standout tracks. I didn't know Justin Scott. Okay, because it doesn't have features on it. Okay, on the when you buy it from Apple, Apple Music, I didn't even know Justin Scott was featured on there. I thought Running Out of Time was really nice, and it kind of reminded me a little bit of the Weekend song, um, which is another one called Time as well. What's the Weekend song called? Um, Running Out of Time by Lil Yeah, It kind of reminded me of the Weekend song. Um, let me see if I can get it up on here. The Weekend. Where is he? Boom, 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 boom 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 i'll just type it on here weekend there's a song on there where i think it even features the girl from um uh what's that thing called from uh what's that korean tv show i'm sure she's in a video right if i'm not mistaken anyway that's the one yeah um i got it here out of time there's a track on the weekend album called out of time that reminds me a lot of running out of time so it, it's just ironic that they've got the kind of same sort of title but i thought that was absolutely banging there's a track here if i'm not mistaken called track five i think that's an interlude which i'm a really big fan of i think it's like a spoken word no sort of spoken. it's like it's like a little yeah ranting about you know how the difficulties of being famous and rich and stuff and there's a re really nice beat or nice kind of tune playing in the background as a bed that's so magical so euphoric feeling i would love to just get that looped you know even sometimes without the vocals just playing in the background it's such a good mood setter it's such a good mood setter it reminds me of those type of songs that you play before you're about to do ayahuasca or something to kind of just set the room and prime it that's what that felt like i thought that was absolutely banging um what's i like I've, I've lost vision i officially lost vision was really nice and of course my one of my favorites was the last track reach the sunshine featuring daniel caesar which i didn't know that she was actually featured on it but i thought that was absolutely crazy good um so for me in terms of the 14 tracks um there's not many skips on this entirely going forward i love the fact that there's so many switch ups in between the tracks that kind of throw you off um and kind of add to the whole overall texture of it and i legitimately can't wait to see him perform this live at some way shape or form but for me i really enjoyed it i really did like it especially coming from a taming parlor fan i didn't think it was like a taming parlor copy or that he was trying to cat it in any kind of way i really did think that he did a good job but clearly the people at pitchfork didn't think he did a good job as you can tell from the review i have here on screen the pitchfork people put it as a 6.0 um this is courtesy of a person called alfonso pierre let me see what he actually said about um the whole album because i actually read this what did he say he says as follows at a, pro, at a surprising listening event last Thursday, Lil Yai introduced his new album, Let's Start Here. An unexpected pivot with a few words every rapper fan will be find familiar. I really wanted to be taken seriously as an artist, not just some SoundCloud rapper or some mumble rapper. This is a speech rappers are obligated to give when it comes time to drum loop to take the backseat to guitars from rapping to be muted in favour of singing for the ad-libs to give up to the background of singers and for the brigade of white producers with plaque line walls to be invited into the fold. That's bullshit to be fair rappers do that because journalists or music critics like alfonso and people within the industry in general for some reason 
they don't treat rap or hip hop as an art form or they don't hold it up in the same level of um you know respect as other genres it doesn't necessarily get it so i think for whatever reason musically sonically some people get you know get it but other people for the most part they just think they're just gonna rap on flipping fruity loop beats and shit and that's it and it doesn't necessarily get the same respect as somebody constructing an album you know in terms of like an indie album or alternative album so because of that rappers try to force the subject or force the issue by pivoting away and doing things a little bit more experimental grabbing their guitar you know getting into dance music or something because they want to be taken seriously so because they can't be taken seriously in the art form that they choose or that they're great at they have to kind of go away outside of it and usually it doesn't end up going that well especially if you're going to try and step headlong into a, another genre you have no knowledge of no interest in just want to do it as a cash grab also it probably isn't going to work out well for you so i think it's a two-pronged attack as much as it could be annoying for journalists to see rappers and artists do the same hip-hop people especially try out the same Line because they want to try something different and whatnot i think for the most part industry people will ha also have to blame are also to blame because they don't respect hip-hop as much as other genres it just is what it is um, it continues rap fans including myself don't want to hear it but the reality is that large slices of music and pop culture rapper is thrown around with a salt in the tongue of course pop culture is also powerfully influenced by hip-hop that is until the rappers get close and their hands reach to the pelts if anything 25 year old yeah he's only 25 you know that's the thing you have to imagine the potential this guy is showing already he's already showed us what he can do in when he's in his pocket Right, he's Marty's pocket. I think that's something you have to give something. I remember seeing an interview with, with the weekend saying the same sort of thing. Where I think it was when before the weekend put out um Kissland, I think. That might be the one that really started this whole like turn to like weekend being like a pop star. Um I think he said something like, Oh, I could make, you know, House of Balloons ten times over and it'd be a smash, right? That sort of sound that he kind of um popularized and invented and is kind of known for it like in the streets right like the streets will never forget that whole flipping house of balloons era right it's absolutely amazing and he said he could do that you know in his sleep 10 times over but he said the hardest part is actually making a pop record like going and working with somebody that's worked with justin bieber and stuff as a writer i forgot his name max martin or something whoever that guy is and trying to construct a hit record that regular folks and their normies will actually gravitate to and not just people who are you know or serially online as much as i am and stuff and i really respect Expected it even though Kislam wasn't maybe overall one of his best projects I felt like that bravery to try something different in the cusp of you actually perfecting your sound and being known for it or you just double down and keep doing it was really brave and the fact that we've seen already from Lil Yai in his you know over, I won't say short career but so far we've seen him be able to do maybe it's been 10 years in it so far in the industry it might be 10 years because I think he might pop out when he was 18 but in general we've seen so much from him already and he's only 25 years old just imagine how much more he's going to progress going forward it kind of reminds me a little bit of young lean of how much potential these guys have i think young Lean maybe is the same age range i think he might be 26 or something as well so these guys have so much potential going forward so i don't think um even if you're not a fan of this iteration of what he's doing just imagine a few more sessions under his belt a few more albums with a similar sort of sound evolving it harnessing it and whatnot so evolving um you know correcting it along the way i think it's going to work um, anyway, continues here. As one of the few rappers of his generation able to walk through the front door anyway because he's typically gushes sweet sound and innocent youthful bearded braid look might be the wrong messenger. What's sour about Lil Yachty's statement isn't the idea that he wants to be taken seriously as an artist, but the question of who he wants to be taken seriously by. But come on, man. You don't want to just appeal to one small base of people. You want your art to touch as many people as possible. Art should be genderless. Art should be should have no race or whatnot. But we know what it is in the real world. We know how people are. If you keep making a certain type of records, people are only going to look at you a certain type of way. So as an artist, you do owe it to yourself, especially if you have aspirations to do other things before you leave this earth. Let's try and do a thing where we can touch more people and get playing on these stages that I've always dreamed of playing on why not what's 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 bad about that what's bad about watching a performance of red or chili peppers playing a flipping glass or something and thinking hey one day I would love to be on stage like that's having people sing along to my flipping indie rock you know flipping anthem that I put together one day that's not a bad thing especially if you're a rapper to pivot away from that I think that's okay anyway it continues here 
when he actually first got on, a certain corner of the rap fandom saw this marble-mouthed enunciation and unwillingness to drool over hip-hop history as symbols of what was ruining the genre. A few artists more beholden to tradition than finger-wagging Pete Rock and Joe Bundle, Vic Mensa, Anderson Pack, subliminals from Kendrick Lamar and Cole. But that was years ago. By now, they've found new targets. These days, yeah, he's respected just fine with rhythm rap. Um, if he weren't, his year-long rebirth of the Michigan rap scene, which has resulted in a good not great michigan boy boy so this guy's not happy with anything he's not happy with the michigan stuff he's not happy with the flipping um indie rock stuff or the psych rock stuff so why are you what do you want from from the yay anyway it continues um so the michigan uh, sorry michigan boy boat would have been viewed solely as a cynical attempt to boost his rap bona fides his immersion there felt earnest though like he was proving to himself that he could do that he could hang so what's not earnest about this, what he's doing? I don't understand this. The respect Yaki is chasing on Let's Start Here feels institutional. It's, it's for the voting committees, for the suits, for the quest loves to shout him out as a future, for Ebo to invite him back to his radio show and say, my bad, you're dope. Never mind if you thought Lil Yatty was dope to start with. The goal of the album is to beyond or expectation of rules and rappers. If I was Lil Yatty, the amount of clout that he has, number one, I wouldn't be giving a fuck what Ebro thinks. Number two, a shout out from Questlove in 2022. So in 2023, doesn't mean as much as it maybe did in the past. This idea that he's kind of doing it for that is absolutely insane. I just think it's purely an artistry thing and wanting to push the envelope and see how far you can get and what you can put out there. I'd imagine him sitting down with somebody like a Drake as well. Oh, yeah. they've become really close friends over the last few years it felt like i'm sure that probably helped it as well the fact that drake went out and risked you know his reputation in rap by essentially making a flipping deep house tech house atmosphere you know what's it, what's it been called atmospheric um flipping house album and that not really working too well with most of his core audience but the fact that he did it was brave enough and maybe someone like a little Yeti looking at someone like that thinking, right, you're the biggest star out. And he's probably heard stuff that we haven't heard before. I'm released stuff thinking, hey, this guy could just make Wu-Tang forever, you know, 10 times over in an album and you'd be happy with it if you wanted to. But he purposely doesn't. And he purposely kind of tries to test himself and push the envelope and tries new and fresh sounds and kind of takes it forward there. I'd imagine that would influence it also. I don't think he cares about those guys personally anyway. It continues here. The big pivot is highly manicured and expensive blend of Taming Parlor style psych rock, A24, um, synth pop and loungy R&B and Silk Sonic S Funk. Nah, don't disrespect it. This album is far better than Silk Sonic's album. That Silk Sonic album or EP came and went. That first single they dropped was absolutely banging. You thought you were gonna get something, you know, on that kind of level, and then the album or the EP really flattered, um, really, really kind of, um, really kind of fell short of the of the kind of expectancy that we had, especially when you consider the talents involved, right? Anderson Pack and Bruno Mars, it was horrible. In my opinion, Let's Start Here is way better than anything Silk Sonic put out as a, as a whole body of work, in my opinion. Anyway, it continues. It sounds so immediately appealing that it doesn't feel experimental at all. In 2020, Yeti's generational peers, Lil Uzi and Playboy Carter released Eternal Take and Whole Lot Red. Albums that pushed forward pre-existing sounds or point of inability showcases that are not only the artist raps, but their conceptual vision. Yeti, meanwhile, is working with Vin Template that's already well-defined and commercially successful. This is what the monologue is for. Nah, I don't buy it, man. I think this guy's a hater and doesn't really understand what they're talking about because you don't want Michigan rap. You don't want him trying to experiment and do something different. What do you want then? Do you want him to, to, to be making flipping Minnesota? Like, you know, until he's flipping, you know, got greys in his hair and stuff. Like, let the guy experiment and try new things. Personally, I like it. I think if you are a fan of Tame Impala and you do love that kind of psych rock vibe and you are a long-time fan of something like an MGMT who I'm obviously super obsessed with and even stuff like Slow Dive and My Bloody Valentine and whatnot, you will definitely like this approach to it. It's a fresh way. It's a cool way. Um, it's a vibe. It's a bop. I'd imagine doing that on Shroom or mushroom or what acid and lsd and stuff will definitely be a vibe also so i definitely co-sign it for whatever my co-sign is worth i definitely co-sign it next week i want to mention this this is pretty cool this is courtesy of andrew schultz he finally did put up the clip that i've been waiting for where he shares a part of his set that he did during the kids super paris fashion week show 
um, I think it was sponsored by Jägermeister, I think, and Puma, and they flew out a bunch of comedians. They were on the show, and it worked really, really well, and they were all able to do little stand-up bits as well in front of a fashion audience. It was pretty cool. And I think Andrew Schultz mentioned it in his recap how he did he put together a little set talking about fashion stuff, and he managed to kind of do a little set where he basically ripped into Alexander Wang and his sexual uh, misconduct allegations that he would kind of went through that I think eventually got dropped and whatnot. But I thought it was really funny and really cool and really amazing how he's able to kind of do this in front of a fashion audience and really poke fun at such a big, big elephant in a room, which I still don't understand how he's able to get away with it. But we'll speak about that on the other side. But this is Andrew Schultz ripping on Alexander Wang. It is amazing to be here at Paris Men's Fashion Week, or as Alexander Wang calls it, the buffet. I think <laughs> he likes to grab dicks, guys. You know, Calm is a good friend of mine. Calm's actually uncircumcised. His parents are here. Mom, is this true or no? Okay, you don't have to put the light on her. Okay, she's gonna sneak into Calm's dick to hide. Just. <laughs> Crazy story. I didn't believe Colm. And this week he's talking about it nonstop. And I go, prove it. Prove to me that you're uncircumcised, right? And he literally takes out his dick. And then out of nowhere, Alexander Wang just grabs onto it. It was fucking crit. Drop it. Drop it, Alexander. Drop the dick. I asked, uh, I asked Colm to dress me cool. He's like, what do you want the look to be? And I, jokingly, jokingly, I say, yeah, dress me like a teacher that fucks the students, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, that is wrong, okay? In America, that makes you a pedophile, okay? I know in France, that makes you the president's wife, but we're not gonna talk about... absolutely amazing i really did enjoy that but it really did make me think about the whole alexander wang thing legitimately made me think about it and about how crazy it was that he got away with it like and the selective politicking and the picking and choosing of things and the outrage machine is really interesting maybe maybe this is the reason why a lot of people in fashion in general just stick to the people that they love and regardless of what the allegations are they just kind of turn a blind eye because everyone's up to their nonsense right i'm sure behind the scenes there are many stories that could be told about certain people getting up to certain things but that alexander wang um story was crazy if i'm not mistaken it was like over 10 people it might be an 11 it might be 12 it might be 13 but let's say it's over 10 over 10 guys for the most part some of them maybe i think were transgender or non-binary basically accused alexander wang essentially of spiking their drinks and then basically being very 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 aggressive sexually to the point where you know people are basically accusing you of being you know rapey and whatnot and this was stuff that was clearly done like it, obviously all these accounts had the same sort of like theme had the same sort of way of kind of getting them back to the home house and stuff it was a really kind of clear there was a clear method to the madness and the and the horribleness of what he was doing and it was clearly something that was a bit of an open secret in the industry about how handsy and whatever else that he could be with certain people and he just got brushed under the carpet if i'm not mistaken they settled out of court which you know I'm no one to tell somebody how to deal with their trauma, how to deal with their pain and hurt. And I'd imagine a lot of those kids, especially if you are trying to be involved in the fashion industry, unfortunately, these things probably will end up kind of biting in your ass if you do step out and talk about it. Because a lot of people, you know, the fact that no one actually outside of the victims, I don't think so, really piled onto him kind of showed how kind of fraught the industry is in terms of protecting people because people want to protect their own jobs. So I don't seriously think... It wouldn't make it would probably it probably doesn't have anything to do with Alexander Wang. It probably just do with the institution. So if people hear that you're willing to speak out about certain things, other people may feel like if you find out about their thing, you might speak out about them. So it's less about to do with the person. You know what I mean that kind of thing. So that kind of leads to people essentially being you know 
sh- like you know see hear no evil see no evil kind of thing and you just keep quiet and just pretend like they didn't see anything or they just gossip about it within the little friendship group but when it comes to accusations and you know putting names and dates to things and backing up certain claims they're not doing it in the slightest even to an extent where somebody like a julia fox who's really this is really funny bit of this whole affair right somebody like a julia fox who's come out of her you know become like a real big activist or a real big proponent of defending um what's her name amanda amanda heard right amber, amber heard amanda heard amber heard and you know the whole issue that she had with johnny depp and whatnot even though amber heard was basically found to be somewhat of a liar exaggerating what went on maybe not the most credible witness and eventually you know for the most part if you're a fair person you would say having you know checked out a few bits and pieces of the evidence that was presented in that court case between them you can basically come to the conclusion that they were probably both really toxic to each other they probably both did horrible and heinous things to each other and no one is coming out of that looking great or smelling like roses but how amber her tried to paint it in the in the first part was that oh Johnny Depp is a big monster guy he's the guy that's evil he's the guy that's brutalizing me and abusing me at home when clearly she was doing some of the abusing herself and that was obviously proved in the court of law to the point where she lost and I think she's to pay damages and whatnot so clearly there's some um, there's some truth in what was said and truth of you know of, of there's some truth in flipping Johnny Depp being innocent for every reason Julia Fox doesn't believe so doesn't believe that and a few other people also out there are saying, you know, believe all victims and um, essentially saying it was a bit of a mistrial and it was unfair. And just defending Amber Heard, which you have, people are free to do, innit? You do whatever you want to do, best evidence to be available. But I just always find it really funny how she was going over, she was really going and defending flipping Amber Heard and basically, you know, crying for her innocence. But then in the same token, wi- willingly and proudly wearing you know alexander mcqueen stuff considering his allegations or considering what he's been accused of and essentially you know settling out of court and you know, whatever you would imagine would be some sign of guilt um in that instance and there's not a word to be said again that selective picking and choosing of cases like i'm going to fight for amber heard but then i'm going to wear and back you know alexander wang and what he does personally i wouldn't i wouldn't care if i'm a fan of somebody's work I'm mature and adult enough to separate the art from the artist personally. I don't necessarily need to agree with everything an artist does or their viewpoints or be down with everything that they do say, where they've been, who they've spoken to. It doesn't necessarily be my concern. I mostly just care about the art. If the art is good, I'm going to back it. But some people out there who make a big stink about, yeah, I can't be friends with people that disagree with me politically. I also can't back people who are abused. All this. If that's the thing, you have to just apply it across the board you have to be consistent but you know we're living in a world where people are full of shit which i am okay with because i know i'm full of shit i just hate it when people don't acknowledge how much they're full of shit and they pretend like the sun comes out of the house like no you're full of shit like the rest of us you have your inconsistencies you have your hypocrisies you do pick and choose um and that's okay you make excuses to people that you like you bury people that you don't we all do that but let's not pretend let's not pretend but anyway big up shots in here regardless i thought that was pretty funny i really did enjoy that what he did so big up him and then that got me thinking randomly that got me thinking randomly what's happened to terry richardson we haven't heard from terry richardson in ages isn't it right the famed flipping um, fashion photographer who was most I'd say famous for his work with American Apparel, although he did plenty of other stuff um, as well. A lot of the things I kind of remember him for was some of the great stuff he did actually that kind of goes under the radar, I feel like, was some of the stuff that he did with um, Vogue Paris during the time when Emanuela Alt was the, what you call it, um, editor-in-chief. And of course, you know, Paris, I think Vogue Paris is gone or something. Is it gone or is it a new team? Or is it Vogue France? I think it's Vogue France now. But anyway, the 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 long established Vogue Paris that's now kind of defunct and turned to Vogue France, I'm not mistaken. Emmanuel Alt was the editor in chief there. And even maybe with Anna Winter, or maybe with Karen, Karen Whiteford also. But I do remember Terry Richardson doing a lot of really good work in that magazine. And that's when I really found out, oh, cut, he's an actual legitimate photographer who maybe dabbled in all that kind of, you know, super overexposed, flashy type of photography for American Apparel. But what he's actually creative and amazing at was what he images he able to create in his editorials for Vogue Paris but of course you know he went through that crazy um cancelling 
thing that happened to him i think he might be one of the first people within the arts that kind of happened to it maybe during me too happened as well and the stories of course around terry richardson were horrible you can only imagine as well based on the pictures that he was taking how handy and how you know rapey maybe he was and abusing he was of course the look of the guy doesn't necessarily help and i googled i thought hey what's happened to him and then the first thing that popped up on new york post was this article it says disgraced fashion photographer terry richardson sells his new york city firehouse because so far, I've not heard a single peep about him in the scene or in the industry. But I do know a lot of these photographers, from what I've heard in the industry, in fashion in general, a lot of them, most of their bread and butter comes from working from very big commercial projects or commercial campaigns. So, you know, stuff with IBM, Dell, H&M, Zara, you know, whatever, all that sort of stuff is what actually pays the bills. And then you do the fun editorial stuff with like id and the face and whatever else magazine out there for fun and to kind of flex your artistic and creative and image making abilities but what actually pays the bill day to day will be the big stuff so maybe he is doing the big stuff with the zaras and the ibms and whatnot behind the scenes and the mercedes and whatnot and we don't really know about it but he's kind of quiet he's kind of been off the radar for the most part i don't really see him anyway he doesn't necessarily go to parties anymore he used to hang around with oliver zam the flipping co-founder or the founder of sorry purple magazine i don't see him out and about there you don't really see him out of fashion weeks like he's completely disappeared from the from the limelight completely and he was one of the you know f more famous fashion photographers around during that time but anyway let's continue it says disgraced fashion photographer Terry Richardson accused of sexual assault, harassment, and exploitation. God damn it! That's a that's a free pronged, um, nasty list of flipping accusations, isn't it? But multiple young models over the decades has sold his home, the firehouse in Soho on Lafayette Street, for about five point five million. The twenty foot wide. 2,800 square foot landmarked renovated firehouse comes with a striking fire red engine Lacard spiral staircase. The three story home was built in 1887 for the FDNY engine company number 55. The brick exterior features terracotta rosettes and stone conic flanked with cast iron pillars topped with a non too subtle flame essence. Inside the residency features one bedroom and two bathrooms. I wonder if this was the place where he did the photography of people stand behind the wall or the white wall the famous ones with Rihanna and Ruiz other models and stuff I wonder if that is the same place where he did it because it kind of looks familiar doesn't it right that that kind of facard and it continues Richardson known for his often hypersexualized campaigns for designers like Marc Jacobs Tom Ford and Yves Saint Laurent is the son of late successful but troubled fashion photographer Bob Richardson in 2017 Act younger Richardson following sexual assault and harassment accusations at the time he said in a statement provided by the rep he is an artist who is best known for his sexuality explicit work um, so many of his personal attraction with subjects were sexual and explicit in nature but all subjects of his work participate consensually of course you'd say that um, Richardson bought this property 3.3 million in 2009. Um, it was the last on the market, asking for a rental of 20. People who who's paying that amount of rent a month? 25,000. This is what I used to get paid to be a retail staff, like at some places, right? For like doing retail for like, you know, sportswear companies and stuff. Sometimes you'd get around this. So that's 21,000 a year. People paying my salary I used to get for a year as a retail staff per month crazy richardson could not be reached at the press um at press time the current sale we hear is off market deal with the broker nick gavin of compass who declined to comment so no comment from him directly but clearly he's selling some bits and pieces raising funds and living a somewhat quasi quiet life but yeah terry richardson got completely cancelled and it was done for him and he hasn't come back since. Alexander Wang legitimately spiked, you know, up and coming models and scenesters and socialized people drinks and got very handsy and then out, you know, out of court or whatever, settled with them. Allegedly, who knows? Don't sue me. And he's perfectly fine to be out there again with his work featured on fucking Vogue Runway. But Terry Richardson, who no charges, I don't think, were come were brought to him really. Did he, if I'm not mistaken, no actual criminal record charges or anything. And he completely gets cancelled. That's really interesting how random these kind of cancellations are. They're very random, they're very picky and choosy. But hey, I just wondered where he was. I got the answer. Terry Chisholm is out there selling his home, raising money and living his life. And from what I've seen from his Instagram, he's gone completely quiet, completely radio quiet. Because if you see his Instagram here, 
um, 900,000 followers, 907 to be exact. The last post he uploaded, which is this picture here, was in 2018. Wild, isn't it? 2018 was his last Instagram upload, more than 247 weeks ago. People are even saying in the comments, Terry Forever, checking in for you, okay, 13 hours ago. But yeah, he hasn't been seen in a while. So, you know, these fashion cancellations are very random. They're very selective. They don't make any sense for the most part. And I guess it just is what it bloody is. So next to quickly talk about, which I thought was somewhat interesting and maybe it would speak to the larger issues going on in terms of this being a reflection of how all that woke lefty stuff when it comes to producing content just doesn't work long term and maybe ignoring source material and prioritizing telling new updated stories with you know quote you know flipping um uh trying to tick boxes and have you know uh, abide by quotas racial and stuff just doesn't work when it comes to content and tv and drama and movies and stuff just create compelling stories um you know write good write have good scripts have decent actors doing the job on screen and you might have a chance but if you've come at it first from like an ideologically possessed point of view you're definitely going to run into some issues you would imagine you would imagine but anyway courtesy of variety this article says the following disney laying off over seven thousand employees or three percent of the workforce and as a 5.5 billion in total cost reduction so clearly things are going a little bit sketch over there at disney it says bob, I bob Iger is back at disney ceo and swinging the axe disney will reduce its workforce by 7,000 employees in a bit to cut cost Iger said wednesday the company's earning call for the year end 2022 the figure represents a 3.2 um, percent of disney's total headcount of about 220,000 worldwide like i said before after being made redundant myself this year or last year and just you know with just age there was a time when i'd look at this sort of stuff and laugh but i think in general this is indicative of the industry and the climate and the economy and it just bums me out when i hear this sort of stuff because you know there's many people out there probably suffering um way worse than i am and who are maybe you know looking at working at disney as a legitimate you know place to maybe grow and work somewhere until you actually retire you know at least with me maybe i could say you know maybe i could kind of comfort myself and say i'm risking it by working for these random startups in businesses or in sectors that aren't necessarily proven with people who don't necessarily know what they're doing and are kind of figuring it out and there's a risk involved but when you're working for disney you would imagine part of the reason why you'd work there is because of your own love with disney as a company what they produce and it means something to you but also you would imagine that you want to maybe grow old and work your way up in a company and do great things blah 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 so for it to suddenly go this way where you're kind of getting let go it would mass layoffs is pretty brutal it continues layoffs are part of disney's efforts to achieve a 5.5 billion in cost savings of that 2.5 billion represents a non-content cost including labor costs and 1 billion for those targeted cost reduction so the pay must be really good in it over there isn't it? if that's going to be turning up to 2.5 billion it's madness um, um, Disney is aiming for the annualized reduction of three billion in non-sports content costs. Disney CFO Kristen McCarthy told analysts um, of the two point five billion in non-content expenses, about fifty percent of the marketing spending, thirty percent represents labor costs, and twenty percent reductions in technology procurement and other expenses. Iga said that he did not take the reduction to cut jobs lightly. I have enormous respect and appreciation for the dedication of our employees worldwide. On the content front, Iga said we are going to really hard we're going to we're going to what we are going to a really hard look at oh dear we're going to we're going to take a really hard look at everything we make in general because things are more competitive world and simply got more expensive yeah i remember reading something actually about how much it costs to make movies especially disney stuff that come out and how much they have to make in the box office to break even i was thinking flipping hell i guess maybe it's just salaries also but maybe just hiring of equipment i don't know but the cost of making movies is astronomical man it gives them such an uphill task in terms of making it work in the box office it makes no sense to me um but they just keep they just keep finding more money to make more stuff so i guess it just like maybe it's a bit of a cyclical thing um the announced job cuts came as Iger announced a new operating structure for disney organizing three core business segments disney entertainment headed by co-chairs dana walden and alan bergman espn led by jimmy P pitaro and disney parks experiences and product led by joss demaro 
for the December 22 two quarter Disney beat Wall Street estimates at the top and bottom lines in the period Disney Plus registered the first ever decline in subscribers shedding 2.4 billion driven by losses at Disney Hotstar wow that's a big decline 2.4 billion people unsubscribed for flipping Disney Plus oof that's a big ouchie mama, to be fair. That's a big ouchie mama. But yeah, um, hold your head up, Disney employees who have been let go. I don't envy you in the slightest. It's not a nice thing to go through that. And I hope you end up working it out. Then I quickly want to mention this regarding Instagram considering looking at a paid verification thing the same thing that twitter is doing right that elon musk obviously introduced has been somewhat successful if you believe some of the figures coming out from places like twitter takeover news which are saying that twitter has over 290k paying subscribers of twitter blue which obviously is the thing that you do to get your blue verification mark and it obviously gives some other bonuses as well in terms of you you know your, your quote your i think your replies come up higher when you kind of are verified and big tweets and whatnot and some other bonuses here and there but i always was under the impression this would work really well for instagram because instagram by nature you know the clout machine that it is the reason why people want to be on there and be seen and you know try and present an image that there's somebody worthwhile or notable it would make a lot more sense to put it on there and to make some easy bucks and easy money because i think i might have calculated it before like imagine you know i think the cost of a twitter blue check mark the cost of twitter blue in the uk is about 11 pounds let's say apple takes six pounds of that and you only get flipping five left five times two hundred and ninety thousand, or 290,000 is still still 1.45 million per month that you're making you know extra on top of anything else that you're doing so clearly that's an easy avenue to kind of generate money and the subscription models you know you're getting money month in month in so it's always going to be helpful that way and for someone like myself who uses instagram as a way to kind of share some of the work that i do creative work whatnot content bits i put out whatnot i do like the idea of paying for the twitter or so the instagram verification especially if they have services linked to it like for instance one of the big things i've always wanted was the ability to link on my instagram stories because i don't really use my instagram feed for the most part i think most people don't either you know the whole idea of our instagram about sharing pictures has completely gone it's disappeared it's essentially now become a platform to share you know screenshots of tiktok things that you see videos screenshots of twitter memes and that's it no one's really sharing beautiful pictures that are taken on holiday um, beautiful pictures of a wedding scenery hiking food it doesn't exist anymore even food think about it like uh, apart from you know accounts i follow that specifically go out and review restaurants or review food there's not a lot of people that I know from my friends list that are uploading or sharing, oh, I ate this here and there on their feed. They may upload what they ate on their Instagram story, but not on their main feed. So clearly that's a big kind of push. And for me, having the ability to link and a link it to your Instagram story would be a big deal. And obviously that's a feature that they kind of lock and kind of have it only available for people that have a certain amount of followers. But if you can have that, if you have a brief verification mark, that'd be absolutely awesome. And of course, if you want to stop some bits of abuse or spamming or whatnot on instagram you could obviously kind of implement that in the long term going forward because i do remember seeing something about elon musk say like oh in the long term he wants to rid all legacy twitter blue verification marks anyway so anybody that has a verification on twitter will be have to be someone paying for it there will be no legacy kind of accounts anymore because it feels like it's been abused and people are taking the piss and whatnot and kind of you know doing some nefarious things in the background or using it as a way to kind of legitimize really dumb or harmful opinions but overall as a thing for instagram i think that'll definitely work but anyway, let's go to the article the article says as follows news um re sorry new references in instagram's code suggest a company could be developing a paid verification feature for in the rollout of a cinema similar system at Twitter under Elon Musk. Recently discovered code snippets reference explicitly so explicitly refer to a paid blue badge and a new subscription product a developer has discovered. The same references also appear in the latest build of the Facebook app, including paid verification could be offered across meta platforms if the product continued to be developed. I'm not really sure how it would work on Facebook. I don't know why anybody would care about having a verification on Twitter on Facebook. I don't even use it like that, to be fair. Um, 
I don't know. Maybe maybe if you've got an artist page or a business page, I'm not really sure. Maybe there is something some validity to it but i'm eager to see how that works out it continues the discovery was made by developer and reverse engineer um alessandra Paluzzi, who was previously spotted a number of new instagram features before they launched including the in-app scheduling tool that launched in november and the newer qr code sharing features he also regularly spotted other internal prototypes like instagram's candid challenges and features in development with twitter typically instagram confirms its smaller tests or prototypes when it's discovered but in the case of the paid revenue option the company chose not to comment which is a big deal that means they're definitely looking into it. again if you're looking at the figures if i'm if those figures i said was right and if twitter are getting five pounds out of the 11 pounds that it takes to twitter blue they're still making one point you know 1.4 million of the 290 subscribers and it'll only go up over time as they start to add more features and whatnot to it you would imagine given Pelusi's track record however um it's worth at least speculating why instagram could be weighing up decision around pay for verification Specifically, Pelusi shared the TechCrunch's screenshot in the app code that included lines that says IG name paid blue underscore badge IDV, blah, blah, blah. And another one that says FB name paid blue badge IDV. He suggested that given the context, IDV could mean identity verification, as was known as also meaning for his acronym. Um, in addition, the developer also f told us he found other references to a new type of subscription product that hadn't been previously I hadn't been there previously. The same references were also in the one, the latest build of the Facebook app he noted. Still, Pelosi cautioned that there's nothing yet visible in the app itself beyond free for these small code references, sorry, so they can only speculate on these findings for the time being. Still, it's fun to speculate to be had and especially considering the mystery of today's Instagram verifications process. So, yeah, let's see what happens, what goes forward. I think it's a really great idea. It would work really well for them. I think there's a lot of people on Instagram who want to look like they're way more famous than what they are so they'll definitely purchase it just for that sake alone it might muddy the waters in terms of an influencer thing in terms of influencer marketing with your brand and whatnot but i think at this point if you're a brand and you're getting hoodwinked by people with fake followers and whatnot you'll probably have your own yourself to blame there's too much information out there and resources to use to see what actually what somebody's real reach and engagement is actually like so you don't need to kind of fake the funk in that way going forward so um i don't think that will harm anything in terms of um, influencer marketing i'd imagine just my opinion anyway but yeah let's see how that kind of rolls out we shall see how that rolls out next we want to mention this i'm sure most of you guys have seen this but i'll frequently to mention because i thought this was pretty interesting so as you may have you some of you might be aware there are these shoes meant to be coming out courtesy of mischief which are essentially mischief essentially putting out these astro boy red booties that have been taking over my flipping timeline and been absolutely everywhere right they've been covered from flipping pillar to post even though they haven't they're not even out at the moment right they're not even out at the moment and they've been everywhere and um I'm kind of over them already, don't get me wrong, but I think as a concept, I really do enjoy them and I really do like them. I think when Mischief do stuff like this, these sort of fun projects where they kind of, you know, it's a little bit nostalgia baiting, it's a little bit intense, it's a little bit of a cheat code in some respects because of the nostalgia attached to Astro Boy and the affinity people have with those sort of animes and can cartoons and whatnot. But overall, I think it's very, very well done, especially when you consider how faithful it is to the original illustration or the original cartoon it looks actually like it in real life the only issue with it obviously as you see on the screen is practically what that would look like when you actually wear it with real outfits going forward but there's all these little prints and bits and pieces i'm going to read uh, where people sharing some bits and information regarding it so far i think it's we know it's going to come out sometime in february and i think it's priced around 350 dollars or something around that kind of mark so um it's somewhat affordable if in that price range i think it's even cheaper than a flipping um than a steroid boot for Balenciaga to be fair. I think it's way more cheap. I think steroid boot Balenciaga might be seven hundred or even nine hundred. So anyway, it continues here. It says this is a little um clip I guess taken from some promotion material regarding the new boots coming out. It says here, Mischief, launching cartoon boots for a core 3D world, Mischief's next project sees the release of an Astro Boy-inspired shoe that brings Mighty Atom into real life. Astro Boy was brought into the world in 1952 by Otto, oh, sorry, Os, 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 Osa, Osamu Tezuka, wherein one, 112 chapters of the manga were serialized in Kobushi Sons until um, 1968. Over the years, we've seen countless allusions of the 
so illusions of the character in footwear and fashions bait being the most prevalent though the multiple collaborative projects but none coming more literal than this next screen it says never before have we seen an adaptation done in such a manner mischief calls them the big and red stating that the big red boots are really not shaped like feet but extremely shaped like boots the pair rep the pair replicates the same shape of the astro boy footwear choice complement with the lip and the butt at the top of the ankle and a comfortable eva sole underfoot um looking at the outsole we we see a ribbed gripped outsole with mischief's only instance of branding which is pretty decent right the fact that they didn't put any unnecessary annoying branding on the side no stamp on the back of the heel and they just trusted the design and kind of wanted to put something out that was tasteful and just put it up at the bottom i have to give them praise and props for that because the temptation probably was there to actually put the stamp on the side but i think the fact that they look so iconic right the big red boots i think immediately people will associate with with astro boy but mostly they'll associate him with mischief because for the most part most people wearing these have never read an astro boy manga let alone watch the anime or any cartoons or anything attached with it i don't i doubt it so i do think the little hit of mischief on the on the soul was a really good idea and a good design choice for them going forward and actually makes them look better than what they actually are but of course when it comes to being comfortable and stuff i'm not really too sure if these are really going to work for most people and you know as you can see with this little clip here that i'm featuring playing on the screen somebody a hype beast i'm assuming grabbed them and put them to where they come in a really massive big red box um oversized absolutely incredible size box i think he's got all the other mischief shoes as well so he's a bit of a collector when it comes to mischief stuff and they typically look pretty horrible it looks like with regular clothes there is maybe a assertion that you should maybe get them and wear things that are a little bit you know it's like people that wear um what's that thing called what are they snow boots so they're snow boots or they're called moon, no moon boots most people that i see wearing moon boots are usually wearing them in a very non-ironic or no a very ironic sort of y2k um way and they're sort of kind of going a bit crazy with the styling in that regard to make those boots work you're very rarely seeing people just wearing moon boots with skinny jeans and a black hoodie because if you're going to wear those type of boots, why not go a little bit crazy with the uppers? So I think with these Astro Boy boots, you probably need to do the same thing going forward. The only thing with me is that when I see people wearing these type of boots and I see them wearing hidden t-shirts, immediately I kind of be like, you know what? I don't want you to be associated with that type of hype beast, with that type of streetwear fan, with that type of head. It's not something that I really want to see and be cool with. So if anything, all this viral marketing that has been done really well online for them has been a bit of a blessing and a curse because you've seen some people rock them and make them look cool. And you've also seen some people wear them like this dude and look completely dorky and completely lame and something that you don't want to be associated with, especially when you see him prancing around somewhere in a car park outside of his house wearing these silly boots wearing a flipping stupid hidden t-shirt so clearly or hidden in a white whatever that shit flipping page is called so clearly it's not something that i'm really really interested in that regard but still i think as a design as something to look at as a spectacle i think it looked pretty cool and pretty interesting i think overall i'd much rather see iterations of these flipping you know um boots from cartoons and shit you know made into real things or inspiration of those things kind of plowed into real things then i would like to see companies going out and making flipping horrible copies of jordan ones and sticking dice logos or thunderbolts on the side of them i much prefer it when they try to do these interesting projects with shoes and try and basically you know offer something a bit fresh and a bit interesting going forward because i think if you're not a sneaker company you probably urge yourself to do that if you come from it from like a fashion creative project design point of view why not try something different why not try something a bit interesting and kind of throw it out there the only thing i was really interested about is that can you actually have the wrong foot on is that possible to have the, the left on the right because they're all kind of rounded shape right this very round oblong oval type shape of the shoe but maybe on the inside maybe it has a bit of an instep on the inside i'm not really too sure but on the outside they don't look like you could tell what side is left or side is right but i'm sure that it does come that way and also I, I did see from the books that they are sized so they don't come like 
I thought they'd be like a size range because of how tight they are. You could just basically have it small, medium, large, but they do actually come as a size. So if you're on a US 11, a US 8, US 7, blah, 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 you can get those as well ordered. So clearly that's a thing there. But so far in terms of outfits, um, I think there's a campaign here for um, that Mischief actually did featuring the one and only Sarah Schneider. And she actually looks fairly decent in them. But I think the issue with these boots, for the most part, what I've seen, they look quite cool stationary when people are sat down chilling. They don't really look that great in motion. And I think a lot of the stuff... Fashion in general, I think, for the most part, a lot of things online, that's the issue sometimes with buying stuff online too much. Seeing stuff in person or seeing other people wear them in real life can really give you an idea of whether or not something's going to work for you or not. And these days, because there's not really many great retail stores, the outside scene or outdoor scene isn't as great as it once was before. There's not really spots where people collect and, you know, and group, maybe outside of fashion weeks, I can't really think of any other places where a lot of people that are into the same brands that I'm into would be out and about so i don't necessarily understand or know how certain things work i think of something like a salomon um xt xt sixes and stuff when i saw them online i never really liked them but now that i've seen them outside and people wearing them day to day has become you know a really popular shoe model i've now kind of been able to put them into context and be like you know what this could work with this outfit this could work with that look but before when i just saw them as a product image with a white background i was like you know what that's not for me so you need to see these in irl but I feel like these boots, they just work stationary. They work, you know, sat down somewhere. They work maybe, you know, jumping in an Uber and go straight to a location where you're going to get stuff brought to your table or you're going to go to a bar that's two meters away from your table. But actually going out and interacting with the world and living day by day, I'm not too sure if they're going to work. I'm interested to see if that guy, what's that kid's name? Is it Burberry, Berry or something? The guy with the spiked hair that is part of Opium and does the kind of wear test and he puts on loads of hype shoes and kind of goes to the skate park and does crazy, you know, tricks and whatnot, wearing really hype shoes and gets people crying in the comments. I wonder if he's going to go out and try and skate them because that would be pretty cool to see, to see if he's able to kind of actually wear them, you know, and skate them and ollie and whatnot and click flip and whatnot do some grinds whatever it may be called out there in the skate park that'd be pretty sick to see but these images of sarah snyder wearing them they don't look too bad but again she's like i'd imagine again people in pictures always look taller than what they are in real life but imagine in real life she must be like five foot one five foot two or something she's very slight very skinny very slim girl so clearly they're going to look quite cool on her in this way but i still think personally for me they need a bit of effort to be worn, to be look good. You, I just think just wearing them with like a basic, like av average outfit you'd wear if he's going to wear a pair of Dr. Martens, I don't think they usually work. I think actually wearing them and going out of your way to kind of style them in a really cute way, you know, as she's wearing in this sort of outfit with a skirt and the top of the holes on it. I think this kind of lends itself quite well to it. Obviously, the picture here with the go with the go kart as well looks pretty cool. I think this looks this works really well with the flipping police cars in the background, but. Yeah, stationary pictures, not too shabby. The official marketing campaign pictures of them don't necessarily sell them that well to me. I'm not going to lie. But there have been some images of regular people who grabbed the pair that don't look too bad. Like this guy, that he's wearing them um, with a pair of shorts at home. They don't look too shabby. They actually look better with shorts on case in point the Astro Boy character has got these like metal flipping boxer brief type of things going on which I think would actually be a good thing. I'd imagine somebody's probably going to make a pair of those, right? Whatever those little short things are that he puts on. So clearly that's pretty much of a good look. I wouldn't mind seeing those. Um, I wonder if if Mischief put out a black pair, if they ever do put out, I don't think they will because they don't really usually do colorways of stuff, right? It's usually one drop of a shoe the way they want it and then whatever else goes from their little projects. But I wonder if they did put out a black pair, if somebody like a Kanye would wear them with his look that he likes doing, what, the skinny jeans and the bomber jacket and shit. I wonder if that would be a thing that he'll end up doing. But they, are pro they look pretty decent here in a somewhat normal looking dude wearing a pair of shorts. I'm not really too mad at that look. And there's a lover look here, I think. Oh, I don't have the one with the Suki in it, that Suki girl. But it's another one with another girl who's wearing them that are pretty decent. But I think this with the joggers tucked into them don't look the greatest. I think them worn the shorts look pretty decent. If anything, the actual cartoon, if you think about it, the image of the cartoon on Astro Boy, the boots kind of look like they come up a little bit higher than what they actually made them. So maybe because of how they crease and how uncomfortable they may be to take on and off, they maybe made an executive decision design-wise and made them a bit shorter. But from the cartoon, they look like they go up until his knees. 
that they look like really, really high boots. Some of the boots like Italian girls like wearing when they come to London. Those kind of riding boot thing nonsense, those shiny ones. They kind of remind me of those. But the box is pretty cool. You've got this foam on the inside and the two boots put side by side. I'd imagine the import tax and duty on these if you're going to ship them from overseas is going to be a lot a lot of money so i'm not looking forward to anybody doing that and buying them in the uk but okay to see what's going to happen but overall i think interesting project i think it's a smart idea um it throws up interesting design proposition i'm not too mad at it in the slightest and i think it's a quite a fun thing to do and like i said before like i much prefer fashion companies doing stuff like this then copying another jordan another air max one design another new balance design and just adding their logo on the side of it that's boring let's kind of be creative and do things that you know maybe streaking companies or sneaker companies can't do because they're a little bit stuck in their ways and you know whatever it may be and just take the easy way out and try and offer something interesting and fresh that may be aligning more to our brand and what we're about and i think this is definitely a good way to go about things so not mad these are the slightest um i love the idea but overall i think the the aggressive marketing and influencer seeding campaign of it has kind of put me off. There's been a few people showcased wearing them who have not necessarily liked the way they've kind of dropped them and what they kind of look like. And it's kind of maybe just put me off overall. And I do feel like it's been a little bit of a, I feel a little bit like a um, play, like payola. Like I feel a little bit like manipulated into kind of liking them in a weird way because they're a little bit nostalgia based. Do you know what I mean? Like if, if, they, if, if I didn't recognize a cartoon or didn't understand it or didn't really remember remember seeing images of Nigo I'm thinking one of his houses with massive flipping life-size figurines of Astro Boy and stuff and remembering where that's from then I wouldn't really be down of it do you so it's kind of I felt like I'm being a little bit duped like do I actually like them or is it because they are tied to a part of my childhood or growing up in a scene that I'm still look at fondly and when I see these images again suddenly I like it I'm not really too sure but either way um, I do like the approach to it um, I think some people have started them pretty decent. Some people have started them pretty horribly. I think for the most part, this guy did obviously the worst job ever in terms of styling and making them look good. I think anybody that saw this guy wear them would definitely not going to wear them and want them anymore because he looks like a lame hidden t-shirts, definitely for an L. But overall, happy to see something fresh out there. I'm happy to see something fresh out there. Next, we want to mention this regarding body movements festival that happened in print work so um i didn't go but i just want to shout them out and just say it's amazing to see that they've been able to put together a very pretty successful festival which again it's a bit of a it's a bit of a cheat this whole festival day thing going on at the moment um essentially when i think of festivals i think of things that happen outdoors but now people are, you know, doing these day festivals, quote unquote, as a way to kind of get around doing longer nights for club nights. Because, you know, for club night it starts at some time in the evening. You've only got a certain amount of time before you have to lock everything off because, you know, of our draconian laws around clubbing and nightlife and whatever, alcohol consumption, blah, blah, blah. So marketing it as a festival and have it start a bit early during the day is a good way to get around it so you can actually get in, you know, 10 plus hours of raving. But, you know, it's still in a club, in a venue place. It just doesn't mean festival. But anyway, regardless, body movements, I still think it's a good idea behind it. You know, particularly aimed towards the queer, gay, LGBTQ, whatever scene. And I feel like now at the moment, especially in London, those guys are definitely the ones at the forefront of pushing culture and definitely providing some of the funnest parties out there in dance music, for sure, or in that level overall. I think we look at stuff like Budokai, look at stuff like Inferno, look at stuff like Howl, look at obviously Body Movements Festival, there's obviously stuff like um, Adonis, um, Homo Tash, Body Hammer, um, the one that the what you call it the guy Charlie something does as well he's got a party also that he does a color factor on the Sunday there's many of these kind of parties from that kind of scene and group of people that are doing that are really going amazing and you know they're obviously going from strength to strength the only issue I'd say for them would be that it feels like there always comes a point where these parties kind of I won't say sell out but they get too big because they become really popular and people start loving like myself you know i can't stop raving about those parties and talking about them and i'm not gay and i'm a normie i'd imagine from that kind of scene right i'd be ascribed as one especially if i'm not coming in dressed to the nines and really going for the club kid look so i'm kind of sticking out like a sore thumb but then when these normies keep coming there and having a good time it'll kind of spread the word it'll get out there similar to what happened to kind of 
um, what's that thing called? Um, horse meat disco. And it felt like, you know, I, it comes to a point where it kind of, you know, it kind of it becomes a little bit cliche. It kind of becomes a bit lame. And then maybe it's sort of serving or servicing the people that you in, initially try to service and represent because, you know, they're represented um, individuals in the scene and you want to provide something for them. And it feels like there's always the moment that kind of happens. I hope it doesn't happen with Body Movement Festival. It feels like it does always happen. So I wonder how they're going to handle that friction. But I do like the idea of having something like Body Movement Festival at one of the most commercial, well-known venues in London. Even if it was just a quote-unquote favor or something that they only managed to do because it's about to close down unfortunately right one of our most iconic interesting venues to look at even though i hate the sound and i think it's you know how they lay it out and the walking is annoying and the searching is annoying and everything i still think to look at visually it's an amazing place and it's a real shame that they can't just hold on to it long term and they're gonna tear it down and turn it into a flipping dull and banal flipping festival of glass and flipping metal with a shitty coffee shop that no one's going to go to and offices that are going to be occupied by the same dumb shit companies that are obviously all over Liverpool Street it's a shame that's going to happen but it is so maybe this was like a last minute favour to kind of just get them you know um, part of the flipping gang or whatnot just to kind of offer something new because there's a free date there but I still love the fact that if I'm not mistaken the day before a body movies festival happened at Printworks Dead Mouse was playing there Again, one of the most commercial well-known DJs in the world was playing there, sold out, doing his thing. And then the next day, you've got all these amazing, you know, with all respect intended, freaks, weirdos, gays, queers, lesbians, whatever, all under the sun, LGBT come flooding in there and living their best life, showcasing themselves, presenting themselves in their best way. Like, I think that kind of contrast is really amazing for me personally i think that's super super cool and if anything that should be what should be happening in most venues going forward in london but obviously you know we have our issues blah 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 so for them as a team it's probably quite satisfying to go from throwing these quote-unquote smaller festivals and now suddenly you're in one of the biggest venues in london and you've got all these people who are basically identified what you're doing feel represented feel seen kind of partying and having a good time that must be such a sick feeling for sure for sure so big up them i'm gonna quickly clip play a couple of clips here i'm showing what they basically did obviously you can see some images here from them which look flipping amazing we'll play this actually this one video there with a the projection on printworks there in the background i just you know what i wish i just wish in my opinion i just wish print work sounded as good as it looks because it doesn't it just doesn't sound as good as it looks i think because if, if you're used to going to these industrial type of places the one that obviously comes to mind is Berghain. you initially think when you walk in or when you see it oh it's going to be like that but when you walk in it just doesn't sound the same the sound is terrible in my opinion it kind of unless you get to the front if you're right at the back it kind of sounds like equivalent to you know if you go to like a barbecue and somebody's got like some dj or you go to someone's like house party and they've got a little dj booth and they've got like some active monitor speakers at the front usually if you stand right next to the person playing or you're right at the front the sound's amazing the moment you go into the kitchen it just sounds like someone's playing speak phones out of their flipping bluetooth speaker it doesn't really carry well and you know whatever maybe especially if you just got two that's what the film basically sounds like all the sound is right at the front doesn't necessarily spread around the whole venue and even though you'd imagine it's kind of well some soundproofed and insulated because it's a former print work factory but whatever who cares um let's play this video this is uh the caption says as follows flooding print works london with queer joy for our winter edition today this will be the first and last body movers festival at print works and maybe the last time you'll be able to experience the iconic venue before it closes explore every corner and take up a space again this print works thing is all about closing man they they honey dicked me so much right i bought that flipping dixon ticket thinking it was the last event and then they've been able to confirm so many more events after the fact like when is it going to be the last event it feels like a sports direct thing closing down sale closing down soon last sale ever it's like either close or open but just do something Wait, let's play the video <laughs> So big up them. That's the people involved in Primark side. Uh, sorry, um, I'd imagine in Body Movers Festival. And let's see some other clips as well. I think that features um, Louis J. Yeah, it is, right? Is that Louis Burt? Is that Louis G. Burt, I'm assuming? 
Yeah, it's yeah, Lewis G. Burton from Inferno. Again, like I always keep saying, if you haven't been to Inferno before, please do. Definitely one of the more finer parties I've been to in London for sure. Performances, club kids, vibes. Um, and the good thing I like about this whole, I like to deem it alternative nightlife scene. It probably is a, a, the most respectful thing to say, I would imagine, but just a kind of way to kind of identify it from the usual things that go on out there, from the usual kind of quintessential tech house nights and whatnot. The reason why I like this really a lot also is the fact that programming wise, they tend to pick people within their own little community. So it's people that they feel like, you know, don't get the love that they need to get. People that are maybe just new, literally just started DJing in the same year. And I feel like that kind of gives it a real community type of vibe. It's all kind of things that they're kind of feeding. And of course, sometimes they get guests and stuff, but for the most part, it's people that represent it or kind of stand behind what they do. And I really love that side of things. I think that really works really, really well. And um, it kind of adds a different sort of flavor to it. And obviously something fresh too, because when you go to their nights, you know you're not going to hear the same DJ that you heard at fucking Fabric, at fucking um, Night Tales or whatever else venue. It's going to be people specific for what they play. And obviously, Luce J, um, sorry, Luce G Burton is one person also that does the same damn thing over there infernos absolutely shelling so let's play this clip of them playing <laughs> That must have been so much fun. Imagine how much fun that must have been. That must have been such a bloody vibe. And then we've got another video here to play. No, another clip. Oh, there's another video actually. Check the people walking and doing the damn thing, enjoying themselves. What's the caption say here? Scroll up. Um, we're back for our summer festival on July 29th. Make sure you RSVP, tell your friends. A moment for our incredible dancers keeping the energy going. <laughs> so good isn't it to me this this is what made it fun to be fair especially after being obsessed and you know um bothered about all the burning stuff that i kept going to all the time and then coming back to london to be depressed of how boring and one note our scene was even though the diversity was really good i feel like you know there wasn't enough club kids with enough of a vibe and obviously full popped up and that obviously serviced a good need but i feel like this whole scene has kind of pushed and kind of pushed people out of their comfort zone and kind of pushed people to be more club kiddie looking wise, going out wise. People really make an effort with their outfits. They're coming something new, something fresh, never wearing the same outfit twice. Like it just feels like a good vibe. And even for someone like myself, it's like a normie. I'm just going to be standing there in all black wearing whatever I usually wear and in the corner just observing things. It's it's a real visual, it's a real like um, uh, sensory delight, right? When all your senses are kind of tickling, seeing all these amazing people you know, frolicking around the place, enjoying themselves, living their best lives, being all comfortable around each other in this quote unquote safe space and just enjoying themselves. That's really, really cool to see just visually. Even if you're not, you know, identify with anything that they're about, whatnot, just to see it as a club kid is really something cool to see, especially if you're used, like I said, like myself, to be sitting in the party where people just dressing all black and a bit boring, to see all that colour and vibrancy is really, 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 really cool. And I'm a big fan of it. And again, one last post here. Um, it says here, I guess from the founders of it, we'd like to thank the 5,000 plus queer and trans bodies that took over London's iconic print works on Saturday. A queer and trans music project being given the first Saturday of print works final season was a seminal moment for us and our community. On Saturday, we had a glimpse into what it would be like with our own little industrial playground. Queer and trans people deserve spaces and platforms like this. Our music deserves to echo through these hallways and our bodies deserve to dance on these floors. We want to thank everyone that helped us make this vision come true, especially the collective and the artists collaborated with it was a moment in history of the books let's make more history this summer love sir have you take how you pronounce her name sarosai someone told me saroche sarosai i don't know please forgive me um clayton and simon body movements for your body your mind their body and the pictures of that's a good thing about print works right um picture wise it's very instagram ready like that flipping shot of the dj looking out on the crowd is amazing really really sick um just a shame they don't have these bits open at the top and at these kind of balcony bits i'm assuming there's probably a health and safety hazard but 
and again, actually, I think the last time I went, actually, I went to go, I went to see a Dixon event, actually. Somebody got so lit that they jumped or they climbed up one of these speakers onto the top and started doing handstands and stuff, like, a bit nuts. But yeah, that crowd, that looks like it's jammed. That looks like it's way more packed than the event I went to with Dixon. The Dixon event was a bit rammed at the front, but towards the back, it was kind of empty. It looks like there was a lot of, you know, what's the thing, queer and trans bodies in that space, for sure. So big up them more images of people in different, I guess, different rooms as well. They're probably occupied, vibes everywhere. So yeah, big up um, body movements, big up what they're doing, what they represent. I guess there's Heron Sue there as well. So doing a good, Heron Sauna, sorry, they're doing a good thing. So clearly it was a success and clearly it went off without a hitch. And again, I think um, it's it's cool, man. It's good for London. We need this. We need this variety, um, a refresh. And the thing I like about it is with all these people, what they're doing, similar to what I said about the Nini H label, um, is that they're putting their money where their mouth is instead of waiting for handouts instead of waiting for festivals to put diversity quotas and whatnot and nonsense in place to have people like them represented in places they're just going out and making it themselves which is great because you know what's going to eventually happen is that people are going to notice and you're going to see a body movements festival body movements festival stage at some big festival place at some big nightclub or something programming a certain whatever bit it might be like it will definitely happen in the future so definitely those things are on the card so i think just doing it yourself and putting your money where your mouth is definitely gets you further than waiting for handouts especially in this scene um especially when you consider how slow people are to kind of adapt to what's going on and what's fresh and generally the industry as soon as you can prove that you can have there's a demand for it and you can sell tickets and you can fill venues suddenly the conversation about it changes anyway it doesn't really matter what you're about as long as you can sell venue and kind of fill it up people don't run up are really cool to kind of help you out and whatnot and sort of work with you in some way, same perform. So I'm eager to see how it goes on, how it evolves, how it develops. And I'm also eager, like I said before, to see how they deal with the tension of having normies, having non gays, non queers, non trans come in and sort of like, I won't say dilute it, but kind of muddy the waters and bring myself included, my normie, you know, regular guy vibe in there and how that's going to maybe disrupt or maybe enhance or help the situation going forward and how they kind of maintain the core of what they're doing and speak to the people who they originally were waiting to speak to. But we have to wait and see for that one. We will have to wait and see. Anyway, that has been the Excellent Thing Show episode number 646. It's been a pleasure to have your company once again. If it's your first time checking out the show, you know what to do. Click all the details down below. Connect with me and all that good stuff. That would be greatly appreciated. Leave me a five-star review with that good stuff. Share the account. Share the program. Blah, 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 blah. You know what to do. As usual, if you listen via the audio, you will hear my tune of the day. If you're watching via the video portion, you won't hear anything, unfortunately, which is fade to black. So what you're waiting for, if you want to hear my tune of the day, if you want to have a little bop, a little skank before you head off, then definitely check out the audio platform or the audio version of the show. Scroll right towards the end and you'll hear the song playing in the background. But until then, until that time, I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Thanks again for hanging out with me. Take care, be safe, look after yourself, and I'll see you again very, very soon. Peace.